A pleasure to be here with all of you. Great to see you. Uh, great to see you all smiling and happy. That's always good. So, Laura, um, you are right now working across the Atlantic. You, you have a business in Spain, you have a business in Miami, you are, uh, you are standing on both feet in the technology sector. I would love to hear a bit more about how you got into tech, how you got into startups, and also what, what is Venture City, how it works, and you know, just tell us all about it. Sure. So, um... So I've been working in technology for since 1997. Um, I was not a good student, and uh, but all the internet was kind of like popping up in Europe, and I ended up, uh, you know, building my first company. I went to college, but didn't do anything, you know, super complicated. I wasn't an engineer; I'm a genius. And during college, I realized that there was my passion was, you know, going tourism and beaches. And so we started a company and uh, back in 2000, bubble burst. And so did we, since then I kept working on this and uh, I had the passion and the, and I was fortunate enough to work in the early days of eBay and Facebook. I was uh, the first employee of, of Facebook in, in Europe. And um, so because of that, I've been working in Europe. I've been living in the US, West Coast, East Coast. I've been responsible for Latin America, including Brazil. So I kind of like been and uh, precisely working in those super mature tech hubs is when I realized that there was a huge gap. You know, not always the best founders were getting the best support. And I was like, wow, talent is universal, but opportunity is not. There's a huge problem here. And I want to be one of the ones to fix it. And that's how the Venture City started. We really feel the gap of those amazing entrepreneurs that don't have the connections or don't have the networks built, but they're building amazing products in technology. And so by working together, we kind of like plug and play them in the right circle so that they become successful. And as a European and having built my company before in Europe, I realized that there was a huge Europe, the US, and Latin America. A lot of the companies that are created both in Spain and in Portugal, but at the same time in some European regions tend to grow internationally to the US and to Latin America. So building those bridges, it made a lot of sense to us. So we do have offices in San Francisco, San Paulo, Miami, and Madrid. I sit in Miami office because I am kind of like in the middle geographically of the offices, but I used to travel a lot all over the place because I really enjoy working and meeting founders and leadership teams in person. So at the end, we have founders from seed stage until seed B plus. We invest uh, in, in them, but we are a team of a very, you know, the operator, crazy people that love to get into the nitty gritty of things. And so we, we kind of like become an extension of the team of the founders that we work with. Okay, <clears throat> that, that sounds really, really great. How many countries do your founders come from? Uh, actually 40 countries. Wow. That's, that's truly global. It is truly global. And it's funny because when I started, you know, a lot of people was telling me, Laura, you have to be focused, choose one market, start from there. What we normally do first. And I was like, no way. The value is precisely in being able to interconnect, you know. So it was, it's, we've been three years already in these markets. And, uh, it's been tough, I have to say. And at first, it was like, how are we going to have founders in Poland and Sweden and Brazil? And how are they going to be working together? Because we believe in the founder helping founders. It's amazing. It's just a matter of hiring the right team, working very close to them. Remote working is something that I've known for 20 years now, it's the beginning of my career with Skype. So, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, 
being persistent and getting there and um and driving value so that's absolutely brilliant laura it's a great story um so you're building bridges across different parts of the world all the time between madrid miami um, do you see how we could build bridges also with Central Europe? You know, Central Europe is this place with all these software developers that are very, very good, and then they need to commercialize internationally. Have you seen much of that, or do you see that in the U.S.? Or how do you how do you think that Central and Eastern Europe could expand more to these regions? Yes. So. Most of the top talent that I've met in Silicon Valley are coming from Central Europe. Most of it. So uh, Silicon Valley at the end is 70% of the people there are immigrants from all over the world. In particular, I would say Europe. Um, so what we need to create in Central Europe is the place where they can scale their companies, you know, faster and outside, obviously, the region. This is, not, this is not something that we are taught in college in Europe. We are taught to grow within Europe, but we are not taught to grow outside, right? So today, with technology, with everything that we have available, is much cheaper because it used to be very expensive and much easier than before. So it's just a matter of creating a few success stories in cases of companies that built in Europe grew from Europe to the world. And I think that we already have a few success stories already. We have Cabify, which is one of the companies in my portfolio, present in over, I think it's 18 countries already, and so many others in Portugal and of course in the Northern. So can we do it? Yes. Is it easier and, and uh, cheaper than before? Yes. Are we seeing now, and this is interesting, that American companies are building their tech teams in Europe soil? Yes, that is happening now. And when that happens, that means that all that talent that is learning how the big companies in the US and the ones that already succeeded are doing it, at some point, we leave those companies and we'll create their own businesses. So thank you, Trump, for stopping immigrant policy in the US, because thanks to that, we are keeping the talent in Europe, and then we are attracting capital, and at the same time, talented founders from America that are understanding that Europe is not that bad of a place to start a business. So I think that we are in the moment of shifting the whole thing around. Okay, so we are facing a big opportunity uh, and the next five to 10 years should be super interesting for people like you uh, who are building these bridges and who are standing on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I wanted to ask you recently with the last three, four months, how have you seen the COVID situation impact your work, the work of your portfolio, um, how they're developing, do they need to pivot? Uh, how is the fundraising and, you know, wh what are the kind of elements that you have seen that have been important that have come up over the last few weeks and months? Yes, yes, yeah, so many anecdotes. So um, I think that COVID is something that uh, is touching all of our lives, no matter if you work on tech or not, if you're in the US or Toronto, or Canada or Brazil or Europe or, you know, it's, it, it's a fact. But there's something that happens in my portfolio from day one. The type of founders that I work with are um, founders that because they don't, they're not used to have as many resources, they build with a fraction of the capital, but they get the same impact and the same revenues, and numbers and everything. So even myself, I am very, very austere, you know? So for some reason, not because of COVID, when we started as an angel investor 15 years ago and as an official venture capital three years ago, we always cherry pick those founders that we know, that we picture ourselves in the worst case scenario with them 
you know, huge financial crises. We never pictured a pandemic, but pandemic, and we can work together. So that kind of skill set is included in the type of people that we have in our team and in the founders that we work with. At the same time, the type of businesses that we work with are health related because those are industries that need so much disruption. FinTech, again, I work in emerging and in mature markets. It's amazing what FinTech is doing in emerging markets. An emerging market for me is Miami, is Austin. So it's not only Brazil or Mexico, right? So mobility, transportation, come on, is one of the worst problems that we are facing today. So we were already investing in that cybersecurity. So happily, I'm knock on wood, except for companies that we have in their portfolio that are doing experience. All of them are growing like crazy. In fact, I would say we were not ready for such growth. So some of them are, you know, a little bit trembling because they are growing so fast that they can assimilate it. So we are working in that kind of a stress now. But uh, in general, because of the DNA of the founders that we've been working with, we are in a very good place. Now, fundraising, which is something that um, is always a hot potato. It's taking me a lot longer to raise my fund too, because obviously the, the potential investors that know me already, you know, it's kind of like this lady, Hispana, with that crazy hair, coming to do this. She's touching three regions. It's a lot more complex, but it's never, it's not impossible. So we will get there. And the same with my founders. They're able, I have three founders that we invested in their seed stage that are raising Syria C now, and it's taking longer than anticipated, but their numbers are there and everything is there. So we are confident that we will get there. Okay, that's brilliant. As you spoke, you mentioned the word impact. And I know that impact is something that is important for you uh, personally, and also as your, as your fund. Um, could you talk a little bit about the impact investment side, how important diversity is also a part of your life and the trends that you see yes. in the products and the solutions going forward? Yes. So um, I think there's a difference between diversity and inclusion. And I think we need to start talking a lot more about inclusion. Because there's numbers and targets, and I hate that. But we have to talk about having people from different backgrounds and different genders and different kind of love taking decisions. That's the type of diversity and inclusion I love. Our fund is by two women, Hispanics in our 40s with three kids and have been working in tech for so long in a foreign country. I am originally from Spain. My co-founder is originally from Argentina. So we have all the different things, right? But my portfolio and my performance to date in a three-year-old fund is outstanding. We are top quartile in the top in the in the 20. 17 vintage in the US. Why is that? Because we see so many different angles when taking decisions of investment. In my investment committee, I have a lady from Russia, a gentleman from Paraguay, my co-founder from Argentina, myself from Spain, engineers, product specialists, data scientists, and crazy ingenious people. So when we get together to evaluate opportunities, we see all the dark, you know, all the potential hidden things that people that dress the same way think the same way. So for me, 
diversity is so much profitable. But at the same time, talking about impact, I think that word is misused because people tend to think, oh, impact fund. Oh, and by the way, choose a woman to, to lead that impact fund because it's kind of like social, um, uh, NGO, whatever. No, 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 no. I believe in impact that makes a ton of profit. That's what I believe. I believe in building products for the base of the pyramid in emerging markets or in emerging cities that help so many people to get put in the financial infrastructure. I believe in job creation and in skill set recycling that helps people that didn't was not able to go to college or was not able to get certain level of education, but make amazing software engineers. I believe in that kind of impact. At the same time, we make it money. But that perception a lot of people put between VCs and impact funds, it doesn't work for me. I'm able to do it all together and have fun. Brilliant. And you also see the same thing in your portfolio companies. You see impact, you see diversity. Yes, you're yes. also having yes. great examples on that level. Yes. So in my portfolio, we have 25% uh, in the fund. We have 25%, I'm just trying to think of this, 25% women uh, founders. It's not really good yet, but we're there. In my growth accelerator, we have over, I think it's already 35% women founded companies. Um, but within my team, almost 50% of the people in my team are women. Uh, I would say that uh, if not 50%, four percent are decision makers are key decision makers. So yes, I mean, we're surrounded by women, working with women, co-investing with women. I mean, but not because they're women, it's because they're key cash ladies, you know? That's what we're doing. That's brilliant. I know, Laura, we spoke earlier about uh, your really well-planned and prepared pipeline review process and your investment process. Uh, how does your team work with and interact with the startups? Could you tell us a little bit on of the sort of the inside of how you run the Venture City? Yes. So, um, as I wasn't as I wasn't a venture capital uh, three years ago, but I was investing as an angel, and, and I love to get into the uh, dirty things of the businesses, and I particularly love to solve complex problems. I you know, when we started to, to when we started the fund, we learned a lot about how other funds do the do the filtering of the founders, the due diligence process. We were new to this, and we thought there are so many things broken down here. You know, founders cannot talk spontaneously, and being their their own selves in front of capital. You know, people. You know, you go to events and you have founders in one side and investors on the other, because investors don't want to be bothered by when they're eating their snack by founders pitching. And I was like, what the hell? And I was coming from Silicon Valley where it's just the opposite, right? There's so many things broken in Silicon Valley, but access and, you know, being able to, to, to talk to anybody at any level, it's one of the good things that Silicon Valley has. So we said, okay, let's take the good of the places and the tech hubs where we have worked and it's implemented in those tech hubs where we believe there's the most potential. So here we came, we changed the due diligence process. We first have a discovery call with donuts and coffee with founders and their leadership team. My team, my leadership team, not only, not only my uh, fun team, my leadership team, everybody in the team, engineers, data scientists, expressing product and the founders. We don't have office furniture. It's just, we have living rooms. So the experience for the founder is like, what is going on? What are these people doing, right? And we ask them things like, what keeps you up at night? What makes you happy of your work? 
what percentage of, of your time you're devoting into things that you don't really enjoy? What's the vision in the next three, five years? What's the biggest problem you think you're going to face? Things that are a lot down to earth. If they pass, that's because we believe obesity and that they don't want to, they're really their true selves. Then we go into the tech due diligence, where the engineers, the data scientists, the product specialists go deep into the core and foundation of the product to understand. It's a very early stage company, it's just the mindset. But if it's a, a little bit more about your company, we see the traction. And there is when you're able to see if there's been, if it's paid acquisition or not, if the the, if the customers are loving the product, there's so many different things, right? If they pass, we go to financial due diligence. And if they pass, they go to legal. At the end, it takes us no more six to eight weeks. But by the time the due diligence is done, they know us so well, and we know them so well, if any of the parties is not comfortable, it's easy to take the decision, you know? I believe that due diligence should be mutual because it's a relationship that stays there forever. And 90% of the time we are probably, we're solving problems, not celebrating. So you'd better be aware of who you are uh, investing with. So it's tricky why we do everything this way is because we really want to be the human people behind the company and the vision. Oh, oh and one thing we always say, we never give empty notes, never. If at the end we can invest, we tell them why very, very precisely, why we can't. And many of them come back. Some of them, they get really upset, obviously, uh, and we keep in touch with them. But at least we try to give them enough feedback so that they can implement it and get things better. Okay, okay. Brilliant, that, brilliant. That's a great process, it's great to hear. Um, I was wondering then, in case of the founders that uh, could be watching us, could you give yes. them some advice as to how they can approach you, at what stage they should approach you, and what with, and you know how to best uh, prepare for for this. Yes, so you can approach me at Laura at theventure.cd. Email me. I love the thing that I enjoy the most of my job is to be surrounded by amazing founders solving big problems, and you know being. So, email you know, me. That's my personal email. I'm not faking anything. Laura at the venture at CD. Of course, I'm in Affinity, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. So, but that is, I would say, the easiest way to reach out to me. Um, so, what was the last piece of the question? How to reach out to me and and then what with? At what point? At what oh, stage? Listen, what proposal? I invest from seed. I'm happy to do first tickets. I love doing first tickets. To Series B. I can do both. I have the fun for Series A. I have the program for seed tickets. Um, so the only thing that I am good at is hard work. So I'm able to help you because the problems that hard work face are not the problems that I know how to fix. So I don't do hardware, but anything industry such as, you know, tech, health tech, mobility, marketplaces, uh, them, things like business models like, um, again, marketplace, B2B SaaS, B2C, network effect, network effect. Uh, we know how to solve that and help you there. Um, I have people on my team from Russia, Poland, Ukraine, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Paraguay, Colombia, US, Canada, Pakistan. So we basically understand tech in all those regions. So we can be able to help you in so many different things. And 
Um, so my advice to founders, you were saying is, look, nothing is impossible. I was told that a lady coming from a Spanish environment had to marry a banker or a doctor to be successful. And I married a skateboarder that happens to be an entrepreneur. I did not study engineer, engineering, but I ended up in the world. I went to Silicon Valley, brought my three kids with me, a husband, a dog, and a lot of things that I don't think I needed, but I did bring with me. And um, and I can, I feel, I'm 44, by the way, no middle-aged crisis. Um, and I believe I can do anything. So founders of the world, you can do anything. It's your gender. Maybe we have to persist a little bit more, but honestly, persistence gives us so much power and so much, um, so much better uh, management at the end. So it's a gift that at the end of the day, we need to persist a little bit more. So just go for it. Of course, build a product to solve it. Don't try to build a product and then try to find the problem that it solves. If you have all that, you will make it. So, you know, VCs, we are not very different to founders. We are not. We have to fundraise. We get rejection all day long. No, no, no. From all over the place, especially from people that we really like. You're kind of like, no, I really want to work with you. No, but your fund is too early for us. So, we so, obviously, like in every industry, there is very boring, gray, and dual people that you will meet, and you have to deal with that. You find fantastic, you know, brain-powered people that will help you grow. So just try to find those iguana coins, as I call them, so that they can help you along the way and persist, persist, and persist. That's great founder advice, Laura. I believe too in determination. And I always think of myself as a, as a in fact, a startup founder. And I see that you, you think the same. Uh, after all, we, we have funds that need to fundraise, that need a strategy, need to grow. And we also have to go out to investors. Exactly. So um, it, it's great been having you here. Um, all the best to the Venture City. Keep growing right across different continents. And uh, it's great advice to the founders. Everyone, just feel free to approach Laura. And uh, she's, a, she's a great I'm, investor. Thank you, Laura. Yes, Take care. I, I am looking for, for 20 new companies for the, the rest of the year for a seat ticket in Europe. 60% of my portfolio is European and the other half are Europeans that are building companies outside Europe. In Europe. So, yes, the venture Brilliant. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Take Thank care. You, Have a great day. My pleasure. Take care.